My question is the, can you name at least five characteristics of a company that gives you confidence to predict its earnings 10 years out in the future? And can you also use IBM as a case study, how it checked all those boxes? Charlie, what are your five? <laughs> <laughs> we don't have a one-size-fits-all system for buying businesses. They're all different. Every industry is different. Uh, and we also keep learning. So what we did 10 years ago, we, we hopefully are doing better now. But we can't give you a formula that will help you. Now, if you're looking at the BNSF Railroad, as we were in 2009, or if you're looking at Van Tile in 2014, there, there are a lot of things that go through our minds, and most of the things that go through our minds are things that will stop us from going further. I mean, there's, there's, the filters are there, and there, there, there are a lot of things that, if we see it in a business, uh, including maybe who we're dealing with, uh, will stop us from going on to the next layer. And, and uh, uh, but it's very. It's very different in different businesses. We are looking for things where we do think we've got some reasonable fix on how it's going to look in five or 10 years, and that does eliminate a great many businesses. But it's not the same, not the same five questions at all. Certainly, when we're buying a business where we're going to have somebody that's selling it to us continue to run it for us, uh, you know, a very big question is, is you know, do we really want to be in partnership with this person and, and count on them to behave in the future when they don't own the business as they've behaved in the past when they do own the business. And that stops a fair number of deals. But uh, I can't give you a five. We don't, we don't have a list of five. Or if, if we do, Charlie's kept it from me. <laughs> <laughs> Incidentally, there's one thing I always find interesting. Uh, we get asked questions about investments we own. and. Uh, people think we want to talk them up, you know, or uh, we have no interest in encouraging other people to buy what the, the investments we own. I mean, we are better off because either we or the company is likely to be buying stock in the future. Why would we want the stock to go up if we're going to be a buyer next year and the year after and the year after that? But, but the whole mentality of Wall Street is that if you buy something even if you're going to buy more of it later on, or if the company's going to buy a, its own stock, and the people think, seem to think that they're better off if it goes up the next day or the next week or the next month. And that's why they talk about talking your book. If we talked our book from our standpoint, we would say pessimistic things about uh, all four of the biggest holdings we have, because all four of them are repurchasing their shares. And obviously, the cheaper they repurchase their shares, the better off we are. But people don't seem to get that point. Do you have any idea why, Charlie? <laughs> Warren, if people weren't so often wrong, we wouldn't be so rich. No. <laughs> uh, he's finally explained it to me. Okay. <laughs> okay, station four. Hello, Mr. Munger and Mr. Buffett. Nirav Patel from Haverhill, Massachusetts. What advice would you give to someone who's trying to network with influential people but doesn't have access to the alumni network of a top business school? Let me take that one. I think you should do the best you can. <laughs> <laughs> Playing the hand you've got. Charlie's very Old Testament on this. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't get much past Genesis. <laughs> they, uh, <laughs> now, it, I, if it was his question that he didn't have a lot of associations because well, of, I just, uh, he'd like to have you help him tap into ta do well without business school training. I never had any business school no. training. Why should you have any? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And actually, I would say the business school training, particularly in investments, was a handicap about 20 years ago when they were preaching efficient market theory because essentially they told you it didn't do any good to try and figure out what a company was worth because the market had it priced perfectly already. Now, 
Imagine paying, you know, thirty or forty thousand dollars a year to hear that. <laughs> yes. You are very lucky to avoid a lot that we, that you've avoided. How do you feel about your law school training, Charlie? While we're on it. <laughs> Well, uh, I have a son-in-law who recently explained how modern profit-obsessed law school law firms work. He says it's like a pie-eating contest, and if you win, you get to eat a lot more pie. <laughs> Over the last 50 years, we Berkshire shareholders have effectively been long sugar consumption through directly owned companies such as Seas Candies, Dairy Queen, and Funding Heinz, and in publicly traded investments such as Coca-Cola today. Yet from improvements in scientific research, we as a society have become increasingly attuned to the true, cross, true costs of greater sugar consumption in the form of rising health care costs. We are seeing this awareness of sugar's impact in changing consumer behavior. Carbonated soft drink volumes are declining, and consumer packaged good companies uh, focused on the center aisles of supermarkets are struggling with organic growth. If we have reached an have we reached an inflection point in human behavior in how consumers view sugar consumption, and do you think Coca-Cola's moat and potentially that of Heinz or Kraft's is narrowing? And if not, what news would it take you uh, to be convinced that it is? Well, I think it's an enormously wide moat, but I think it's also true that the trends you described are are, are happening. But uh, you know, there will be 1.9 billion eight-ounce servings of Coca-Cola products, not Coca-Cola, but Coca-Cola products consumed in the world today. And uh, I, 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 uh, I don't think you're going to see anything revolutionary, and I think you will see all food and beverage companies uh, adjust to the, re to the uh, expressed uh, uh, preferences of the consumers as they go along. No, 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 no company ever does well ignoring its consumers, but there will be, I, I would predict 20 years from now, there will be more people, uh, there, there will be more Coca-Cola cases consumed uh, than there are now by some margin. Back in the late 1930s, Fortune ran an article saying that the growth of Coca-Cola was all over, and and when we bought our Coca-Cola stock in 1988, you know, people were not that enthused about gross profitabilities for the product. Uh, I sit here as somebody who, for the in the last 30 years, one quarter of all the calories I've consumed come from Coca-Cola. And that is not an exaggeration. I, I am one quarter Coca-Cola. I'm not sure which quarter, but uh, uh, and you know, I, if you really, I don't think there is this choice. I think there's a lot to be said about being happy with what you're doing. If I'd been eating broccoli and Brussels sprouts and all that all my life, I don't think I'd live as long. I, you know, I, <laughs> every meal I would approach thinking, you know, it's like going to jail or something. And, uh, and, uh, now, I think, uh, I think, <laughs> Charlie? <laughs> yeah, Charlie's 91, and his habits aren't that different than mine. They're slightly better. But, uh, yeah, there's no question about it. The way I look at it is sugar is an enormously helpful substance. It prevents premature softening of the arteries. And and the way I look at it is that if I die a little sooner, that'll just be avoiding a few months of drooling in a nursing home. <laughs> Charlie and I have enjoyed every meal we've ever had virtually, except when I was eating my grandfather's, and he made me eat those damn green vegetables. But the uh, uh, I there. There, ha there, there obviously are some shifts in, in preferences, although it's remarkable how durable uh, uh, items are in this field. We, Berkshire Hathaway, I believe, was the largest shareholder of General Foods from about 1981 or thereabouts to about 1984 when it was bought by Philip Morris. 
And, you know, that's 30 plus years ago. And those same, those same brands, uh, you know, they went through Philip Morris, they got spun out as Kraft, they broke Kraft into two pieces. But now we're going to own those brands and they are, they're terrific brands. But, um, you know, Heinz, Heinz goes back to 1869. The ketchup came out a little later. They went, they went bankrupt actually uh, when they were counting on the horseradish or whatever it was. But the, but the ketchup came out in the 1870s and Coca Cola dates to 1886. And uh, it, it's a pretty good bet that an awful lot of people are going to like the same thing. And when I compare drinking Coca Cola, you know, to uh, you know, something that somebody would sell me at Whole Foods. Uh, uh, I, I don't know, I don't see smiles on the faces of people at Whole Foods. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I like the brands we're buying, Andrew. Okay. <laughs> Off the top of my head, um, how about the uh, dollar as a reserve concern currency? Do you have any issues or concerns in the next 50 again? I know we're in a good position now, but uh, with, that, with us losing that position. I think the dollar will be the world's reserve currency 50 years from now, and I, I think the probabilities of that are very high. Nothing certain, but I, I would bet a lot of money on that one. Charlie? <laughs> well, I have a, a little feeling on that subject. I'm probably more nervous than a, a, a lot of people about printing a lot of money and spending it. There are times when you have to do it, I'm sure. And I, we just came through one. But I'm happier when we uh, print money and use it improving infrastructure than I am when we just spread it around with a helicopter. So what do you think is gonna happen if we keep spreading it around with a helicopter? I think it's always more dangerous than the economic progression of things. Hello, I'm uh, Leonid Sagalovsky. I'm from uh, Chicago, Illinois, and Berkeley, California. Um, I'd like to thank you for giving the opportunity to ask this question. This is my first meeting. I tend to attend once every 50 years. <laughs> and also for your uh, essay on the, both of your essays on the uh, past, present, and future of Berkshire. As we reflect on the last 50 years, I'd like to ask you this question. What was your most memorable failure and how did you deal with it? Thank you. Yeah. Well, we've discussed Dexter many times in the annual report um, where I, uh, back in the mid-1990s, I looked at the shoe business in Dexter, Maine and, and decided to pay 400 or so million dollars for something that was destined to go to zero in a few years. And I didn't figure that out. And then on top of that, I gave the purchase price in stock. And I guess that stock could be worth me, I don't know, maybe six or seven billion now. It makes me feel better when the stock goes down because the stupidity gets reduced. Uh, uh, no, nobody misled, no, nobody misled me on that uh, in any way. I just looked at it and came up with the wrong answer. But I, I would say almost any time we've issued shares, it's been a mistake. Wouldn't you say that, Charlie? Of course. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we don't do it much anymore. No. Um, we, we probably could have pushed harder, particularly in the earlier years. We've, we've always been, well, we've had all of our own net worth in the company, we've had all our family's net worth and we've had all these f friends that came out of our partnership, many of whom put half or more of their net worth with us. And so we have, we've, we've been very, very, very cautious in what we've done. And there probably were times when we, we could have stretched a little and pulled off something quite large that, that uh, we made a mistake looking back. But, I wouldn't want to take a 1% chance, you know, of wiping out my Aunt Katie's net worth or something. It just, it's just not something in life that, that uh, I could live with. So uh, I would rather be, you know, 100 times too cautious than 
than 1% too incautious, and that, and that will continue as long as I'm around. But the people looking at our past would say that we, we missed some big opportunities that, that we understood and could have swung if we'd wanted to go out and borrow more money. Charlie? Well, it's obviously true. If, if we had used the leverage that a lot of successful operators did, Berkshire would be a lot bigger. A lot bigger. A lot bigger. Yeah. And, but we would have been sweating at night. It's crazy to sweat at night. <laughs> Over financial things. <laughs> Over financial things, yes. Yeah. Well, we won't pursue that.